July 1945, the war still going on, there was a major study, uh, secret of course now, public declassified, there was a major study of the State Department and the War Department uh, which warned of what they called a rising tide all over the world wherein the common man aspires to higher and wider horizons. Now, that's what underlies the threat of ultranationalism. Now, what about Russia? They said, well, Russia hasn't yet demonstrated where it stands with regard to this rising tide, but we don't have any proof that Russia has not flirted with the thought of associating with these dangerous currents. They haven't yet demonstrated clearly that they haven't flirted with that thought. Therefore, we can take no chances, and the study recommends that we have to surround uh, the Soviet Union with military bases, uh, you know, everywhere, uh, but, and also deny them uh, any access even to warm water. We deny them even any control over the Dardanelles, their one warm water access. Uh, the planners who proposed this were concerned that this proposal might look illogical, uh, but they concluded that it's what they called a logical illogicality. You've got to <laughs> think about that. The reason it's a logical illogicality is that our benign intentions, we being the United States and England, our benign intentions can be taken for granted. I mean, it's just obvious. Uh, but in the case of the Russians, uh, they, there is no, there's still a possibility that they might flirt with the thought of associating with the aspirations of the common man to higher and wider horizons. No fear of that for us. No, we're not going to do that. Uh, but they might. Uh, and therefore, it's a logical illogicality. Now, it should be stressed that right through this whole period, St uh, Stalin's crimes, his awesome crimes, which were well known, uh, were, of, were of absolutely no concern to Truman and other high officials. Truman wrote in his diary that he liked Stalin and admired Stalin. Uh, he thought it would be a catastrophe if Stalin died. He described him as honest. Uh, what happened in the Soviet Union was none of his business, he said. Uh, other leading figures agreed. Uh, all that Truman required, as he put it, was that the United States get its way 85% of the time. Uh, other than that, Stalin could do what he felt like uh, at home. Uh, and that's, again, standard, exactly as with a host of other murderers and torturers of lesser scale. The un unacceptable crime is disobedience. Uh, and again, I stress that same is true of priests who preach the preferential option for the poor, uh, secular Islamic nationalists, uh, Islamic fundamentalists, uh, democratic socialists, or any kind of independent variety. That's the logic of the Cold War, exactly as it's the logic of the North-South conflict generally. Now, the Cold the Russia was so big and powerful that, the, that this particular case of the North-South conflict uh, took on a life of its own. Uh, but other than that, it falls into the general pattern. And with uh, the end of the Cold War, we can predict uh, pretty confidently, uh, and could have 10 years ago, that the consequence will be exactly as in every other case. So take, say, at the opposite extreme, Grenada. Uh, we managed in the nick of time to save the United States from destruction by Grenada, uh, invading it and overthrowing the government. Uh, and uh, Grenada was then going to become a showcase for capitalism and democracy, as you remember. The United States poured in aid. It uh, had the highest per capita aid in the world outside of Israel, which is a special case, doesn't count. Uh, uh, and this was going to show, you know, how benign and wonderful we are. Uh, well, uh, you can have a look at Grenada today. It's a total ruin. Uh, almost. There's one... Uh, one part of the economy is successful. It was a front page story in the Wall Street Journal a couple of weeks ago uh, saying that it's not a total catastrophe. I mean, it's true, you know, hunger's going up and uh, everybody's unemployed and, you know, everything's falling apart and so on. But there's one good thing. Uh, Grenada has the uh, uh, highest number of banks per capita of any country in the world. Now, a bank means a, a little office somewhere with a computer and a fax machine. Uh, since Grenada has no laws or anything like that, uh, a bank can call itself, uh, uh, you know, Grenada uh, if using this office, and it doesn't have to worry about taxes or reporting profits or 
uh, regulation or anything. It can launder drug money, you know, can do anything it feels like. Uh, this does create some employment for, you know, a couple of dozen lawyers or something. Uh, and that's the one part of the Grenadian economy which is in fact flourishing, apart from that total disaster. Uh, and very much the same story happens over and over again when the ultranationalist threat is, is crushed. I don't have to give you examples, it's entirely standard. And we can see exactly the same process going on in, uh, uh, in Eastern Europe. The, uh, if you look at the economy of Eastern Europe relative to the West, it was declining up until about 19, using UN figures, it was declining up until about 1913. It then increased pretty sharply relative to the West up till about 1950. Then it was sort of stagnant, rel you know, stable relative to the West. Uh, by the 60s, it was beginning to decline, uh, but still p pretty much stable into the 1980s. In 1989, it went into free fall. You know. Now it's just a catastrophe, typical third world catastrophe. Uh, and in fact, it is returning to a third world structure. Uh, the th typical third world structure is a two-tiered society with a sector of, extremely, of extreme wealth, often unbelievable wealth, uh, linked to foreign investors and so on and a huge mass of uh, people living in total misery, uh, and that's the direction that Eastern Europe is going. And furthermore, again, predictably, the sector of extreme wealth is to a large extent the old Communist Party, you know, the guys who knew how to run things. Uh, if you're opening a, you know, a McDonald's franchise or something or other in Russia or you know, a GM plant in Poland or whatever, you turn to the people who know the ropes you know, who have the connections, who know how to, you know, how to do things. And they're usually the, the ex-nomenclatura, you know, the old Communist Party. And in fact, what's developing there quite predictably is what Martin Willicott and the Guardian the other day called nomenclatura capitalism. You know, they've, the, the ex-party hacks discovered that you can't maintain power by beating people over the head yourself, uh, so you therefore beat people over the head for the foreign investors. Uh, who are quite happy to have somebody who knows how to do it for them, uh, and we're now moving into the standard uh, third world pattern there, exactly as you would expect. Well, the return of this vast region uh, to the third world where it belongs, uh, that uh, uh, has great effects on the West. In fact, it offers new weapons uh, against the population at home in the Western societies uh, as well. Uh, because it can function exactly the way the rest of the third world does. And the business press has been kind enough to point this out quite lucidly, so let me quote from uh, the international business press. Uh, take General Motors, world's biggest corporation. Uh, it's uh, closing down two dozen plants in North America, United States and Canada. Uh, it's already the largest employer in Mexico, uh, taking advantage of what is called uh, the economic miracle of the past decade, which has driven wages down by 60 percent, uh, uh, offering all sorts of new opportunities for profits. Uh, uh, it's also opening plants in Eastern Europe. So the London Financial Times about a year ago had a front page story on a new $700 million high-tech plant that GM was opening in East Germany uh, with high expectations. The reason is that there's huge unemployment uh, and they can get workers there, skilled, trained workers, for 40% the wages of the pampered West European workers, okay, uh, I'm quoting. So, uh, and furthermore, they don't have to offer them uh, uh, benefits and they'll work longer hours and all the problems caused by the pampered West Europeans they can forget about. Uh, well, other corporations get the same idea. Uh, and there's another article in the Financial Times a couple of weeks ago pointed out, uh, thank, I'm quoting, thanks to rising unemployment and pauperization of large sectors of the industrial working class as the capitalist reforms proceed, uh, you can now get workers for a tiny fraction of the wages of the pampered Western European workers in Poland uh, for 10 percent, not 40 percent. Uh, and the wages are kept down that way by the government's tougher policy on labor disputes, as the Financial Times puts it, meaning their ability to break strikes. With trade unions shackled by law and subdued, unemployment high, uh, 
uh, and the uh, EC social chapter rejected so that employers are protected from over-regulation and under-flexibility of labor. So there's green shoots in the UK as well. Uh, and of course, Americans have to learn the same lesson. Uh, the basic idea has been uh, quite clearly expressed by business leaders. Uh, for example, uh, Harry Gray, who's the uh, CEO of United Technologies, major US conglomerate, who explained about 10 years ago that we need a worldwide business environment that's unfettered by government interference, such as package and label, labeling requirements and inspection procedures to protect uh, consumers, meaning uh, that, the, that the, the overriding human value, the only real human value, is profit for investors. Everything has to be subordinated to that, uh, and the government isn't supposed to interfere to, to prevent that development. Now, uh, Harry Gray doesn't object to certain kinds of government interference. For example, the kinds that keep his corporation alive. Uh, the corporation's an offshoot of the Pentagon system. It's publicly subsidized, wouldn't exist if it wasn't for a vast public subsidy fed through the Pentagon system. Uh, and that's typical. Uh, the neoliberal rhetoric is to be very selectively employed as a weapon against the poor. The wealthy and the powerful will continue to rely on state power, as they always have done back to uh, 17th century England. Uh, so under the, and under the Reagan years, for example, uh, needy mothers with children, uh, for them, aid uh, declined uh, rapidly. But uh, aid for needy executives uh, rose to new levels. That actually is the, in this context, we can understand quite well what the current so-called trade agreements are about. Agreements like GATT, or in North America, NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, uh, what they're intended to do, and again, this is said pretty frankly, is to freeze in place uh, these developments so that in case there is what's called a democracy opening, that is, you know, the danger of some democratic movement developing, uh, people won't be able to, to, to modify these uh, successful uh, institutional structures. Once it's written into international treaties, they become quite hard to change. And one can easily understand why democracy is so feared, uh, not only in the third world, but at home as well. Uh, and there is a theory about it. Again, you know, it's not a secret. The theory has always been, I'm quoting, that the general public are ignorant and meddlesome outsiders who must be put in their place. And their place in a democracy is to be spectators, not participants in action. Since it's a democracy, they have a role. Their role is to select, uh, 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 to lend their weight to one or another member of the uh, responsible men, as they're called, uh, representatives of private power. So they can lend their weight to one or another of these representatives to lead them every once in a while, that's called an election, uh, and then they're supposed to return to their personal concerns. Uh, they are the ignorant and incapable mass of humanity, as Robert Lansing put it, Wilson's Secretary of State, and they have no other function. It's too dangerous to let them get out of their place. Well, that's the progressive end of the spectrum. I happen to be quoting from Walter Lippmann and his progressive essays on democracy. Uh, there's a spectrum, and at the reactionary end, we have, say, the Reaganites, uh, who reject even the spectator role. Uh, their picture is the population has no right even to see what's happening. Uh, uh, the more liberal and open-minded people say they have a right to see but not participate. Uh, so when you, under the Reaganites, for example, you had unprecedented recourse to censorship, uh, clandestine terror operations. They're clandestine to make sure that the public doesn't know about them. Clandestine operations are only targeting the domestic population, everybody else knows about them, uh, and a whole host of other devices to ensure that, sta that the powerful holy state uh, is not troubled by the rabble. And uh, uh, Reaganite radical statists uh, you know, reach, raise this to new peaks. Uh, notice that these trade agreements like NAFTA and GATT uh, provide a move towards the reactionary end of the spectrum. Uh, they create a system in which the public is totally unaware of the decisions that are uh, affecting their lives. 
these agreements have large-scale effects, but nobody knows about them. Very few people can have any idea what's happening in the GATT negotiations, let's say. Uh, uh, you have to be a specialist to figure it out. Uh, and in that manner, that in other respects, we can uh, approach what has always been the ideal, namely uh, formal democratic procedures, but devoid of any threatening substance. So citizens not only do not enter the public arena, uh, but scarcely even have an idea of the policies uh, that will shape their lives and don't even know that they don't know uh, the ultimate in destruction of democracy carried to new levels uh, in, the moder in the new world order. Well, always structures of governance have coalesced around concentrations of domestic power. In recent years in the West, that's been primarily economic power. And that process continues, too. Uh, one major phenomenon of the past years, particularly the past 20 years, has been what's called the globalization of the economy, say, shifting production to uh, high repression, uh, low-wage areas, and so on, which accelerated a lot in the last 20 years. Uh, and that has consequences. Uh, one consequence is that, in fact, uh, new governing structures are developing uh, to serve the interests of the transnational corporations and investment firms that, are domi that dominate increasingly the world economy. And again, the business press is quite frank and forthright about this. So about a year ago, the Financial Times in London, which is the world's best business newspaper, uh, described in a lead article what it called the de facto world government that's taking shape with its institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, uh, GATT, the G7 meetings, uh, the EC executive, the European Community Executive, and so on. Uh, these new governing institutions are to serve the interests of the transnational corporations and investment firms and so on, private economic power, so-called, of course, state subsidized, uh, which run the world economy. Uh, that's one consequence of the globalization of the economy, the creation of new uh, governing institutions which have the inestimable uh, value that they are complete, that they're not only immune to public pressure, you know, this rising power of the masses and all that business doesn't influence them, but the public doesn't even know what's going on in them. Again, just like, just as in GATT, you can hardly know what's going on inside the IMF or the World Bank. Uh, no way to find out, again, unless you're a specialist, and even then. That's one consequence of the globalization of the economy. A second consequence, very visible, you don't have to walk more than a few steps from here to see it. Uh, a very visible consequence of the globalization of the economy is the globalization of the third world model. Uh, that's a natural consequence of the globalization of the economy. If you can shift production to high repression areas, uh, to these places where there's these green shoots, like uh, huge masses of starving people and powerful police forces to, you know, to keep them under control and so on, uh, that makes a large part of the domestic population just superfluous for production. Uh, incidentally, they're increasingly becoming superfluous for consumption as well. Uh, in a more national economy, uh, you needed the domestic poor to sell your goods. So Henry Ford was a you know, great innovator. He recognized that if he wanted to sell cars, he had to pay workers a living wage, so he actually raised wages. Uh, that was necessary in a more national economy. It's much less necessary in an internationalized economy, a globalized economy. Produ uh, production can be uh, shifted to high repression areas, uh, and it can be directed to the international rich men, you know, the wealthy classes internationally. Again, that's a lot e easier in the modern period when things can shift around uh, uh, freely. Uh, nobody knows whether this is really going to work, but that's the model that's developing. Uh, and a, uh, uh, a third uh, consequence, of course, is that it's necessary to establish control of the ideological arena, uh, and that's the reason for the, uh, the doctrines that are proclaimed that I mentioned at the very beginning. Okay, well, let me, let me just say a brief word about these so-called free trade agreements, which are a large part of the system of domination and control. I'll be very brief, but they're quite important, and one should think them through. Uh, uh, say, take GATT or NAFTA. They are called free trade agreements. That's highly misleading. 
and by looking at how it's misleading, we can understand a lot about the New World Order. First of all, take the word trade. Uh, trade is a very odd word to use for an international economic, a set of economic relationships in which, for example, for the United States, according to latest figures, about 40% of U.S. trade is within a single firm, meaning one branch of the Ford Motor Company in Mexico is shipping something to another branch of the Ford Motor Company in the United States. That's called trade. But that's not trade, you know, in any serious sense, any more than if you own a grocery store and you shift a can of peas from one shelf to another, it's trade. Uh, it happens to cross a boundary, but other than that, it has nothing to do with trade. It's just centrally managed interchanges, centrally managed by a very visible hand uh, inside huge uh, uh, corporate structures. Uh, which internally have no market properties at all. That's always been understood. Uh, classical economic theory held that there was a kind of a, you know, a free world sea, and inside it there were tiny little islands, like a mom and pop grocery store, which internally weren't, you know, didn't go by free trade. Well, by now the islands are about the size of the sea, uh, and the sea isn't free trade anyway. Uh, so what you have is centrally managed trade by huge corporate institutions. It has nothing to do with trade. Uh, secondly, uh, the agreements don't restrict themselves to trade in any traditional sense. So a major part of the current GATT negotiations has to do with uh, what are called services, meaning finance, for example, and investment. Uh, the point is to open up third world countries to take over by Western banks, which will ensure that they'll never be able to develop national economic planning uh, of the kind that enabled the rich to develop in the first place. That'll be undercut because their resources will be held and controlled by huge transnational banks uh, based in the rich countries. Again, that has nothing to do with trade or freedom. Uh, a third uh, relevant uh, property, going back to Adam Smith again, uh, if, if you read Adam Smith, you find that one of the foundations of free trade is what he called free circulation of labor. People can go anywhere. Well, you know, I mean, nobody's even dreaming of that. Uh, so that's uh, 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 another, uh, that incidentally is a point that the third world emphasizes constantly in the uh, international negotiations, but the rich men don't want to hear about it, naturally, so it never even, you know, there's no perception of that at all. Uh, a fourth and, again, crucial point is that the rich are opposed to free trade, even actual free trade, exactly as they always have been, except when they think that they can win the competition. I mean, Britain is a perfect example of that, historically. Britain was opposed to free trade right through the mid-19th century. It used highly protectionist measures uh, and, and simply state force uh, to, uh, de to, to crush the colonies, for example, to deindustrialize India. Uh, incidentally, Ireland as well, uh, 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 and to create its own industrial superiority. By the time it felt it could win in the competition, by about the mid-19th century, it turned to free trade. You know, the guy who's going to win is always in favor of free trade. Uh, and England more or less held on to free trade doctrines until about the 1920s, at which point Japan was starting to undercut uh, British production, not incidentally by cheap wages, but by greater efficiency at which point England just closed off the empire. Uh, the 1932 uh, Imperial Ottawa Conference raised tariffs so high in the imperial system that Japan couldn't compete. Well, you know, you're not going to win anymore, so free trade is out the window. Uh, and that's the way it continues. The same is true of every other country. Uh, the United States has it, you know, if the United States were pursuing the principle of comparative advantage, the principle we try to impose on everyone else, uh, the U.S. would still be exporting furs. You know, that was, that was our comparative advantage. Uh, we certainly wouldn't have a textile industry. Uh, textiles were developed in the 1820s, and so by cutting out, by simply barring cheaper British ex, uh, textiles. Uh, the U.S. has a steel industry uh, because British steel was cut out in the late 19th century. It has computers uh, because uh, the computer industry is publicly subsidized in the 1950s when computers weren't marketable, it was 100% subsidized by the public. Then when you could sell the things, public subsidy went down to about 50%. Uh, 
uh, uh, through, that's part of the Pentagon system, the U.S. system for concealing the fact that the public is subsidizing uh, uh, viable sectors of free enterprise. And in fact, the, the only sectors of the U.S. economy, virtually the only sectors, major sectors, that function uh, are those that are publicly subsidized via some sort of uh, trickery or other, often the Pentagon system or the space agency or whatever. Uh, and the same is true of every other developed country. I mean, up to, you know, Japan, Germany, South Korea, you pick it. There, to my knowledge, there's no exception to this. There isn't a single example of a developed country that got that way except by radically violating these principles. And furthermore, they still violate them. So in the last 10 years, uh, 20 out of the 24 OECD countries, you know, the rich guys, uh, increased their protectionism uh, in parallel with, uh, you know, free trade bombast. Uh, the Reaganites leading the way very often. So under the Reagan administration, uh, the proportion of U.S. imports subject to one or another form of protection literally doubled, went from 12 to 23 percent, and the same was true of other aspects of the economy. Uh, the, uh, uh, furthermore, uh, all of this, this is an, a crucial factor, as the U.N. and the World Bank have pointed out, uh, it's a crucial factor alongside of Western protectionism, alongside of the what are called structural adjustment programs of the IMF and the World Bank. That means imposing free, a free trade regimen on the poor. The combination of increased protection in the, in, the, in, the, in the West and imposition of a neoliberal model in the poor countries, that's led to a, a doubling of the gap between the rich and the poor in the past 30 years, according to the, uh, the UN Development uh, uh, Program. Uh, and it has also led to a huge flow of capital from south to north. Uh, there's uh, just in, in the last 10 years, the flow of capital from the rich, from the poor countries to the rich countries is just for debt service alone is about half a trillion dollars, which is the equivalent of uh, six Marshall plans in today's dollars. You, uh, you may have noticed that Oxfam called for a Marshall plan for the third world about a week ago. Well, that's nice, but. It wouldn't even touch things. There have been six Marshall Plans from the poor to the rich in the last 10 years just from debt service alone. All of this is uh, in part a consequence of the playing around with uh, uh, protectionism for the rich and free trade for the poor. Uh, finally, the uh, uh, one leading principle of the Western countries, particularly the United States and the GATT negotiations, is to increase protection, increase protection for what's called intellectual property. That means things like software and, crucially, patents. Uh, the idea is to guarantee that uh, the uh, multinational corporations will monopolize the technology of the future, uh, including electronics and uh, aeronautics and, crucially, biotechnology and so on, which means that they will monopolize the means of life, you know, seeds, uh, drugs, and so on and so forth. Well, again, that's crucially important. And has, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it has nothing to do with free trade. It's the opposite of free trade. It's increasing protection. And that's one of the leading uh, doctrines of the Western countries, particularly the United States. In fact, if you look at these agreements, they're a mixture of liberalization and protectionism. Uh, they go far beyond trade. And they're designed uh, for and by uh, the rich men who are supposed to rule the world. Uh, the fact of the matter is that neither at home nor abroad uh, does the real world uh, even begin to resemble the dreamy fantasies uh, that are now fashionable among the intellectual class about history converging to an ideal of free markets and democracy for which America is the gatekeeper and the model. Well, we can see the direction in which things are going if they're unconstrained. Uh, they can be constrained. Uh, there have always been conflicting tendencies. Uh, there are these tendencies. There are the tendencies of the ignorant and meddlesome outsiders uh, to meddle more and to impede these processes and to take affairs into their own hands. Uh, in the last 30 years or so, there's been a very considerable increase in this throughout the world, and particularly in the United States, which I know best. Uh, has been rather dramatic, in fact, though it doesn't have much in the way of institutional structure behind it. Uh, both tendencies exist, uh, as they always have. Uh, which one prevails will uh, determine whether there will be a, a world uh, in which a decent human being would want to live. 
Thanks.